Hi, I'm here talking today to Dr. Mikhail Blagoskloni. Uh, he is a scientist who studies aging, a professor of oncology, um, and advocate of rapamycin. Uh, I've spoken to him before, and we're going to, going to continue our conversation here again today. And uh, thanks for coming on, Mikhail. It's, it's good to have you on again. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> It's my pleasure talking to you always. Thanks a lot. Um, so let's let's jump right in. Um, you began your scientific career studying cancer, and um, and you are a professor of oncology. So how did that lead to your studying aging, and in particular, how did that lead to studying rapamycin in connection with aging? <laughs> <clears throat> I was studying senescence of cancer cells, senescence, induction of senescence uh, by anti-cancer drugs, because I was working on anti-cancer therapy. And surprisingly, uh, rapamycin um, prevented senescence instead of in inducing it. But it was not by chance observation. Uh, I had a hypothesis that uh, cellular senescence developed when cell cycle is blocked, so cells cannot divide, but growth promoting pathways like mTOR and MAP still active, driving, uh, I would say, Futile growth, pathological growth, which I call geroconversion, which leads from reversible arrest to irreversible, irreversible senescence. So um, then we were looking for testing this hypothesis, which pathways um, involved, and we used several inhibitors of MACMAP pathway, P3 kinase, mTOR pathway, and the best um, drug that inhibited GERI conversion to senescence was rapamycin. I also focused on rapamycin because it was clinically available drug in contrast to MEC inhibitors that were not available at the time. And uh, we tested it uh, by you know, measuring reversibility of cell cycle arrest, which was golden market. So then I realized that this is not only in vitro phenomena, but also organismal phenomena that mTOR may be involved in organism aging. It's, it was like analogy. In cell culture, when proliferation is blocked, then mTOR drives senescence. And in organism, when developed, growth is completed, then the same pathways drive organismal aging and diseases, age-related diseases. And um, it, I, I moved from cancer research to aging research. Um, and Fortunately, I have no, I was not indoctrinated by uh, aging research before. So I uh, was free to think that um, aging is not caused by accumulation of molecular damage, which is accumulates, of course, but and would kill organism, but it's not life limiting. So organism 
dies from um, hyperfunctional mTOR driven aging as an example. mTOR is not the only pathway that involved, of course. So, and pathways that drive cellular senescence are actually identical to pathways that make cell cancer. But in cancer cells, these pathways like mTOR activated by mutations, for example, PI3 kinase. In senescence or senescence, uh, I, I sometimes pronounce senescence, sometimes senescence. Uh, how would you pro pronounce? Uh, I, would, I would say senescence. So I will say senescence too. So in senescence, the same pathway is activated by some feedback loops and so on, not by mutations. So um, basically I'm answering this question. Okay, and let me, let me ask you a follow-up if, if this doesn't take us too far afield because it's not, not necessarily concerned with aging, but does your insight into cancer and the and its analogy with senescence does that relate at all to the idea of cancer as a metabolic disease rather than something that's mostly driven by genetic mutations well actually one doesn't exclude another because these genetic mutations uh, happen uh, in metabolic pathways. <laughs> well, of course, cell uh, uh, organism metabolism also affected. For example, in mice, fasting uh, delays cancer, or calorie restriction delays cancer. The same rapamycin, which also change metabolic pathways, uh, and it delays cancer in mice and some scientists even think that it's not that rapamycin uh, suppresses aging of the organism but it just delay delays cancer so mice lives longer but there are many arguments against this it's probably, and I named one of my articles, uh, inhibiting cancer, prevention of cancer by inhibiting aging. So cancer is age-related disease. And if we inhibit aging of the organism, I use the word aging for organism and senescence for cells. Then uh, we delay cancer, age-related diseases, and all other diseases. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Thanks for that. Um, you made some discoveries um, earlier that were um, more or less uh, recently rediscovered. Um, could you talk about some of those? Uh, yes. So. Um, uh, I would say that my work was not probably well understood by aging researchers. Uh, so, because um, I moved to this field from oncology and um, something that was obvious for me was not probably obvious for aging researchers. So uh, uh, recently, rapamycin was announced xenomorphic uh, because it's inhibit hypersecretory phenotype of senescent cells and SASP. SASP. And um, 
this is like a marker of senescence. Uh, but uh, when we were working on this 16 years ago and later, uh, we found that it prevents, most importantly, uh, conversion from normal cells to senescent, senescent cell. And um, we used this marker like SASP. I never considered it even important because it was expected that anti-inflammatory agent like rapamycin would inhibit SASP. It, I thought it, it would not be convincing in our work. So we mostly used golden marker that we prevent an irritability of senescence. And also large morphology, cell morphology and beta gal and so on, but mostly um, that we rapamycin maintained ability of cells to restart proliferation when cell cycle is released. So, and for that reason, uh, I called this um, drugs, it's not only rapamycin, but like MEC inhibitor, uh, gerosuppressants, or gerosuppressants. Uh, the reason, because rapamycin was known as immunosuppressant, so I changed to gera. And glucocorticoids and, for example, anti-inflammatory agents also inhibit SASP, but in no way glucocorticoids extend lifespan. So this uh, um, focusing on SASP is it's only one of hyperfunctions. Uh, there are thousands of hyperfunctions besides SASP, which happen in, in all cells, depending what they are doing in the organism. It's, SASP is uh, more or less universal, but it's not the only one. Another example, what was rediscovered, so-called um, geroscience hypothesis, which basically I described in many papers, uh, like with titled um, treatment of age related diseases, but slowing down aging and validation of anti-aging anti drugs by treating age related diseases and so on. And it seemed to me also obvious at the time. So, and it was known, this was discussed even before my work that inhibiting aging would delay age related diseases. So now it's known as hyperfunction hypothesis. So there are some other examples, but probably I don't want to take too much time on that. Okay, so so um, you you had this idea and and of hyperfunction theory and and how it related to senescence and the hyperfunction of other all other cells, and it it was it was new to aging science. They they were it it was you 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 injected this new idea in, into aging science. I've certainly, I've read all of your papers on aging and I certainly don't think there are many other people in the field who are um, discussing it much or, or emphasizing it in any case. So um, yes, that's, that's, all, that's all very interesting that you, you, know, you brought these fresh ideas into the study of aging. 
Right. Is, is that is that a good characterization of of the way it is? What the way right. I described it? Right. But um, also hyperfunction theory made many testable predictions, which I published in most complete paper in 2006. And in four years after this publication, I also published about hyperfunction theory four years later. So at that time already was shown that predictions are working, including that rapamycin extends lifespan in mice. First paper was by Harrison published in Nature in um, 2009. And we also published one year later um, in American Journal of Pathology, Life Extension. And then it was like 40 publications of life extension. And some effects were very dramatic. And um, I like uh, some papers by Matko in Berlin also late, later on uh, that show that the higher dose of rapamycin, the longer life. So it, it's never reached plateau. So it's important. Um, and, but I would not say that no one uh, at all um, um, accepted this. It was few peoples, but they were, for example, David Jones from London. He developed it further hyperfunction theory, quasi-programmed diseases to C. elegans. He showed that C. elegans also die from age-related diseases, but they, of course, very different from human diseases, but it was completely like hyperfunction theory predicted. So, um, and also one doctor in practicing doctor accepted this. It was Alan Green who started treating himself with rapamycin and then effect was so dramatic. Um, probably you can read on his website the, the story. So now he is treating 700 patients. So it, it's not really necessary that everyone accept it. Uh, it's important that those people who accept it, they can develop it further. Right, right, okay. And, and let me, uh, let me just, uh, for, for the benefit of, of those watching and listening, let me just um, s state more plainly that Dr. Blagoscloni once wrote that if, if rapamycin does not extend lifespan, then everything we know about biology is wrong. And of course, Dr. Blagoscloni was completely right in, in his prediction. Um, so I, I think that shows incredible insight. Um, what you mentioned, uh, Dr. Green, Dr. Alan Green in New York, um, what would you say is um, the significance of him starting to treat patients with rapamycin in, in terms of um, the, the bigger picture, in terms of um, more widespread recognition or use of rapamycin? Yes, it was turning point because um, otherwise 
medical doctors would be afraid to do this. Uh, so he showed example. It was very bold to start such practice at the beginning. So now uh, other doctors accepted this. He showed that it's very safe and effective. And at least, I know at least um, five, six clinics in US and heard about some clinics in Europe that use rapamycin for life extension. But I think there are a lot of them now opening. Okay, very interesting. And yes, like you say, um, there are more now that are doing that, more doctors prescribing it. I've seen, uh, I don't know, like half a dozen or so um, uh, doctors around. I, I'm guessing there are probably many more that are maybe not so public with their, with their uh, you know, uh, willingness to, to, to prescribe rapamycin. Um, do you see rapamycin as the most important anti-aging intervention currently available now? And um, what other promising anti-aging anti interventions, if any, do you see coming along in the near future, say in the next decade? Uh, besides inhibitors of mTOR and MEC now they are also clinically available. Um, very interesting results on life extension. Not so many drugs extend life in mice, by the way. It's more talking about this, but no data. Uh, so drugs that extend lifespan in mice repeatedly uh, is acarbos which you know very well of course um, and alpha estradiol it's uh, not beta estradiol which uh, make feminize uh, effect and about acarbos it's basically close to very low calorie diet. Um, it prevents, um, let's say, absorption of carbs. So in my mind, it can be substituted a carbos with a ketogenic diet or very low um, carb diet. And but alpha estradiol is unique. It uh, probably has no similar effects, uh, not the same effects as um, in fasting or low carb or whatever. And it's different from rapamycin. So this is very interesting. But it extends lifespan only in male mice, but um, men live shorter than women. And although it could be used probably mostly for men, for longevity, it's also important. Um, what else will be coming? I don't know. Um, because it's unpredictable, discoveries are unpredictable, otherwise they are not discoveries, otherwise we already know them now. Uh, actually, I like your ideas about iron and in aging, so I think that um, um, some agents or interventions that decrease excessive iron, excessive, it's against hyperfunction, um, maybe will work. Um, 
but I don't want to speculate too much on that. Well, yes, you're you're totally right. I mean, if if they if uh, if we could anticipate this the the discoveries, they they wouldn't be discoveries. Um, yes, a a carbose is very interesting because basically it mimics mimics a low carbohydrate diet. Um, right. I I want to thank you. Mikhail, for for agreeing to this interview with me. It's been a very interesting and productive conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I hope I'll be talking to you soon. Thanks again. Bye now. Bye.